Welcome again to the club room. My name is Mark Moyer and I'm super excited to have you here. But more importantly, I'm excited to have Robert Hamilton Owens. And the reason he goes by Hamilton is because he was concerned that there are too many other Robert Owenses out there. And there are. So I'm really happy he did that. So he's one of my favorite people with a middle name. He was born a long time ago. No, he's 71 years old, but he never met his parents. He was adopted by a California judge and he was raised as a special needs kid. He couldn't even play kickball with his classmates because he wore corrective shoes. And what's interesting, and he doesn't know this, but <clears throat> I did too when I was a kid. And it was the same thing with me. And uh, let me tell you something. I don't know what happened back in those days. It, so many people had to wear these things, but it sucked. It really did. So he wore those. But you know what's interesting is that he went from special needs back then and having to wear these corrective shoes to in high school training with a legendary uh, U.S. Olympic swim coach. Then he goes and joins the U.S. Air, Air Force uh, uh, Special Ops School uh, as a pararescue man. And um, for anybody who doesn't know Pararescue Man, it's special ops. They're all badass. When they go through training, I mean, it's, it's like Navy SEALs, but even harder. Out of 157 people, only seven made it through, and he was one of them. He was uh, constantly being asked to uh, go into all kinds of risky rescue operations. You know what? He's been rescuing people ever since, quite frankly. He's, um, he did uh, the World Marathon Challenge, completed that, seven marathons seven days on seven continents. Absolutely insane. By the way, flying to Antarctica, you get off the plane, you run for 26 miles in your freezing cold weather, get back on the plane, you fly to South Africa, you run a marathon. You, this time you're boiling, your feet swell way the hell up. Then you get back on the airplane, you fly to Australia, run a marathon, get on the airplane, fly to Abu Dhabi, run a marathon, fly to Portugal, run a marathon, fly to Cartagena, I think it was, or Colombia. I may get this one of these wrong, but anyway, uh, run a marathon, Miami, run a marathon. That's one crazy week. Uh, lots of other things that he accomplished. I'm going to, uh, we're going to talk about those soon, but in the meantime, with all the accomplishments he's done, I want to talk about a mission that he's doing, uh, which, he, which is going to be starting in early December. He's going to be rowing across the Atlantic ocean. That's right. That small little pond to my right. Um, and it's going to take 40 days, 40 nights of rowing. Um, absolutely, I don't know. I mean, insane, but I'm going to let him talk about it. And um, on top of all that, he's the father to five kids. So um, he's kind of busy. And I'm going to have him tell you the rest. Robert, come join us here. Hello, everybody. Welcome, Robert. Thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Yeah. Welcome to the club room. I guess the first question I have for so everybody, you can tell everybody, where are you based right now? I'm based in Newport Beach, California. The lovely Newport Beach, California. Um, the, the lovely Newport, like the Ohio State. The, the <laughs> Anyways, uh, that's that's pretty awesome. And you've been there for quite a while. I've seen a, a bajillion videos of you coming in and out of a gym and doing all kinds of badass stuff inside the gym, um, but also riding bikes, recording videos on beaches, all kinds of stuff. Um, you are uh, one of the very first uh, people that I think was involved with TikTok. Am I correct? I made that up, by the way. I have no idea. <laughs> I think you've made another mistake. <laughs> Add it to the list. Anyways, um, but look, uh, what I really want everybody to hear about today, though, is, you know, um, you've accomplished so much in your life and your career. What What's coming up is something that's very important uh, to, I know, to you and to me in terms of um, what you're and why you're doing it. Go ahead and tell everybody if you could, number one, what sort of prompted you to want to, and maybe the term want isn't the right one, but prompted you to sign up to row across the Atlantic Ocean. And then from there, why are you doing it? What's inspiring you to do it? That sort of thing. Yeah. Um, uh, some of you know, or don't know, I was a US Air Force pararescueman. Some of you don't even know what that is, but that's the Army, Navy, the Marines uh, are offense. And then the Air Force is the smallest of the special ops communities and we're defense. And so we're combat paramedics. When I was in, there was 3000 Navy SEALs. There was 200 of us. And we're the small hidden group that when those guys on offense get shot, they call us to go in and get them. And so our job is 
rescue work. So when the helicopter went down in, in Osama bin Laden's backyard, it was all Navy SEALs and one PJ. And it was our job to be there to get them out if something went sideways. So we're everywhere, we're on, you know, with all the special ops teams, oftentimes just assigned to be ready to go, or we're in the theater, so in, in Lone Survivor, um, um, that helicopter that got the uh, got shot down, um, there were PJs inside there going to do the rescue work, as well as Navy SEAL guys. Anyway, uh, presently, I work for an organization called SEAL Fit, and SEAL Fit is a CrossFit gym that was designed as a contract from the Navy to become a SEAL Fit and to help special ops candidates get ready to come into the buds. And the word got out and then the Army started having kids come over in Air Force and Marines to be tested to see if they had what it would take to, to make it when you get in. And I now work for SEAL Fit as a paid coach and we put on crucibles and those crucibles are six hour nonstop, 12 hour nonstop, 24 hour nonstop. And then the big one's called Kokoro, it's 50 hours nonstop. Why 50? Because when you get into Hell Week with the Navy SEALs, the gun goes off, machine guns, lights, banks, you know, noise, everything goes off at five o'clock on Sunday evening. And then they have to go to Friday at five o'clock, five straight days, maybe on an hour or two hours of sleep. And so most of the kids psychologically um, bail or quit by the 50 hour mark. And the 50 hour mark is on Wednesday, Wednesday night. And if a kid can make it sleep deprived, nonstop, push ups, pull ups, run the beach, do boats, if you can do that for 50 hours, those kids could make it usually to Friday. They were stupefied by the 50 hours and they were in a stupor all the way to Friday. So my Navy SEAL Commander Mark Devine devised a program to get them ready to experience 50 hours nonstop with all Navy SEAL instructors. And he's been doing it now for like, oh, I don't know, maybe 12 years. Okay. I, this last class was class 70. And um, anyway, I'm a paid coach for that. And so I've been around death for a long time, putting guys in body bags and um, rescuing. I was a beach lifeguard. I had my first person die in my arms at 15 and a half at the San Clemente Pier. And I had my second summer, I had a lady die on me when I was 16, my junior year. Um, and I was like rescue work, ski patrol and that. I got into this thing, been around death and issues, and paramedic stuff, you know, jumping in, scuba jumping in, whatever it would be. Mm -hmm. And then, um, Seal fit comes along and I do the night shift and the night shift is the first night we take these kids on a heavy ruck. It's nine miles up and nine miles down and they have to make it in about six and a half hours. So we run them hard. It starts at 10 and 10 at night. They've been up going since seven in the morning. They've just done a Murph test at uh, seven 30. They've just done a mile test about eight o'clock and in the dark oftentimes, or sometimes in the daylight, whatever we decide. And then we take them up a mountain and I'm on the night crew and the night crew is myself and a guy named Mark Crampton and a guy named Mark James, who is a Navy SEAL instructor today. And I did this with Mark James for about um, six years. We were the night crew. The second night we take them into the Pacific and we run them all night long in San PT from about 8 30, 9 o'clock at night till six the next morning. They're wet and they're sandy and they're doing burpees and, running in the surf, running down the beach. We take them from, if you know California, we take them from um, Carlsbad to La Jolla, <laughs> running the sand wow. in and out of the ocean as they do that. Yeah. Anyway, this last two classes ago, um, Mark Crampton was an E-9. He was a chief master sergeant um, for the Navy. He was the commandant, the head of BUDS, mm -hmm. and he was also the commandant head of sniper school. So you read about Chris Kyle, he was one of the students, you know, if you read any mm. Mark Sotrell, all those guys, you know, he's, he's been there forever, 28 years. And then he's been out 12. Okay. And every night 
when we're together, we laugh and talk as, as parents or as grandparents. And we would run these kids at the ground. Um, after two of our crucibles ago, he went home and uh, got the press out of nowhere and went ahead and blew his head off. And so we looked at each other and his wife and this guy, Mark Crampton, was Navy SEAL Commander Mark Devine's mentor. Hmm. Real close. And we all just again said, what did we do wrong? What did we miss? What, what did we not see? He's been out for 12 years. Doesn't drink hardly at all. Um, works out. You know, just a normal guy. But guys have snakes in their heads. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, we lose 18 to 20 veterans a day and a higher percentage in the special ops community. And so we all did a self-evaluation of, and, and, the, and the other problem is that we have a program for vets for PTSD and for suicide stuff. So we have a program in place and he's never said a word about it, never joined that group. So we have all these coaches that are coaching guys working through their stuff and Mark sitting on the sidelines watching. Mm -hmm. But he, seems as normal as can be. And so the, the irony of we have the program and we all talk, how you doing, blah, blah. And he doesn't talk to anybody. The first email that I made was to Admiral McRaven. And I said to Admiral McRaven, I said, did you know Mark just blew his head off? He goes, yeah, I just heard about it. And they were, you know, I did like 11 deployments together over his 25 or 30 years and drank beers together and, and Bahrain and stuff. And, you know, just sat around and talked and, Mark would always tell me Admiral McRaven stories. If you know Admiral McRaven, mm -hmm. he wrote the book, you know, make your bed, did the speech, make your bed. Anyway, um, I just thought I need to hop in more. You know, I'm not going to live forever. I'm 70, going to be 71 next week. Um, I need to do more good. I need to make more of a difference. And so when I did the 777, the seven marathon, seven day thing, the guy said to me, hey, when I got done, he goes, hey, Owens, you know, I got one for you. I said, why? He said, you need to row the Atlantic. I said, no, I don't. That's stupid. And he goes, no, no, you'd get off on it. It's a, it's a trip. You need to try this thing. I said, I don't know. So they call me and they say, we need a blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I said, I'm going to row the Atlantic. And I'm going to do it as a veterans fundraiser for veteran suicide prevention and try to get more um, knowledge out about suicide in general and then military suicide and then special ops especially suicide right and right. i i need to make more of a difference yeah mark so <clears throat> i think uh you know when someone you know when this guy said well you got to row the atlantic um i don't know if he's rode the atlantic has he yeah he has he just got yeah. done yeah that's uh I can't imagine rowing for 30 seconds in the middle Atlantic. I mean, the notion of seeing no horizon, I mean, your horizon is water. It's completely water, but you've got these waves you got. And, you know, I, I don't know what the weather is supposed to be like in December and January. I'm sure you can tell me in a minute, but uh, to me, just the fact that you do it for a few hours in the middle of nowhere is, is insane. And, and so I'm curious to know, have people warned you about, less the physical and more the mental challenge of doing this well people have warned me about everything yeah <laughs> <laughs> like like don't do it dude i mean like why would why do you want to do it? my wife goes really <laughs> you know i mean over christmas over new year's you're, you're gonna be gone the whole season you know i said you know i'm really sorry you know what you've been you've been knowing me since i was 16 so nothing's really changed and this is a really good cause and i think that i can make a difference getting the word out and so she just shook her head and said here we go and um yeah they, they warn you about everything what happens is is that i'm a mindfulness coach i teach mental resiliency mental toughness um, mental strength conditioning uh, we take our kids and we put them in a mind gym so we, when we train these candidates, we train their minds because the mind quits before the body does. So yeah. we, we train them on how to strengthen and grow their minds. And then we say, because in 10 minutes, we're going to crush you. 
And if you do what we say, you'll live. If you don't do what we say, you'll quit. And when you quit, we'll get you out of here. We'll just get rid of you. You don't want that. Right, right, right. And so if you, this is, you can imagine it. If we're going to spend two to $3 million on a immature 18 to 30 year old and expect them not to foul out and make some stupid mistake, like getting drunk, or drunk driving, or doing, you know, doing something stupid. If you, if we're, if you think we're going to do that, you're crazy. You're going to grow up or you're going to get out of here. We're not going to let you in. So in order for you to grow up, you know, if you're white, Italian, you know, Catholic, black, whatever your background is, we don't really care. It's done. It's over. We're going to retool your mind with neuroplasticity and teach you how to think right. Because you're going to have to make decisions under pressure out there. Like, you know, Al Qaeda's chasing you or whoever it is, ISIS, you know, whatever that, the, the thought was, you better mm -hmm. stand the game. And so we work on their minds. And since I'm a mind coach, helping people handle pressure, corporate people, moms and dads, military. Mm -hmm. um, I thought this would be a great way for me to be an example of, I'm going to go do a mind trip. It's three hours on and three hours off for 40 straight days. So you never get more than an hour and a half of sleep and you wake up with just enough energy and to go row for three hours, then go pass out again. And so you've got to keep your mind in the game because your mind will wander or you'll make a mistake. And I want to say to these 18 to 30 year olds that I work with when they say, Hey coach, I say, yeah, what, you know, I want to say, you can do this. If I can do this three hours on three hours off for 40, 50 days, you can do what you can do. You have talent, but you haven't developed your talent. Right, you haven't right. sharpened your pencil. You have this, you got this core talent inside you, you got all that wood around it. And if you'll let somebody work on your issues with you, you can get a sharp pencil and that thing will work for you. And that's what we try to do with people is say to them, if you'll either you work on your issues or your issues will work on you. Makes sense. So, uh, look, I'm going to interject here and there uh, with some uh, questions that some folks are asking that I think are pretty interesting. You know, one of the questions that Deanna has is she says, you know, how do you help those who are claustrophobic? Um, you're going to obviously, as whether you're a SEAL, pararescue, whatever, whatever you're doing, Navy, especially in, on a boat or in a sub or something. Um, and I'm imagining even though you won't necessarily be let me ask you this when you're when you're rowing across are you at any point covered or are you sleeping out in the open or how's no, that no. work the, the the boat has capsules on the end there's okay. a boat with mm -hmm. airtight capsules cabins that fit maybe three people okay and they have an open lid and when mm -hmm. they go down you from the inside you screw it tight so when the boat flips in the storms Okay. <laughs> it self writes. So it's a self writing boat. Oh, interesting. Okay. And so when it gets real bad, you just unhook from outside, you go inside, you're locked down, get that bubble in there. And then sometimes two days, three days, you're locked in that thing while you're going around and around. Or... Yeah. And then it mellows out. And then you open your hatch and you come back out and you play again. So claustrophobia will be a yeah. huge issue for three guys in a small little compartment. And if it gets real bad, you'll end up with six guys in there. And um, that's six guys, you can't move for a day or two. And so it'll be an interesting experiment to see. I mean, I'm the oldest guy by 20 some years. I'm the only American in this thing. And they're all younger than me and they all think that they're hot, you know? So I'm, I'm gonna, I mean, I, I've sailed this before. I've sailed from the Canaries to the Caribbean. I've been okay. out there on that ocean. And it'll be a trip for these, these land people who think that they like to row in a lake or a river to get out there. I'm very fortunate though, because my skipper is very unique. She's a, a really neat lady. She's a police harbor woman. She does in uh, London's harbors. She's a police woman on the harbors and she's rowed the Atlantic already solo by herself. And she's rowed in this boat before two years ago. Wow. And she's my skipper. And we did a, a thing, a training run, a seven day training run in Scotland in the North Sea. And I was so impressed with her. I said, you lead any place, I'll go follow. You're just, nice. you got great leadership skills. 
you're tough as nails, but you can be a sweet too and fun. And anyway, so I, and then we have another guy who's rode the Atlantic before on the boat. And so the rest of us will learn for our first time that we're novices and it'll be an interesting thing. And then okay. there'll be a satellite phone and we'll be talking every day to people. There'll be a feed you could follow us. And uh, the big question people is, is there a support boat? And the answer is no, there's no support boat. So what happens if somebody gets hurt? You call a freighter out there to come by and pick up somebody and yeah. put them in a boat and they go wherever the freighter's going. And there, but there's no support. You carry all your own food. We have solar on the on the lids of these capsules, so we make our own electricity. And we have a water water desalinator, where you make your own water every day. Right. Anyway, so that's some of the stuff. No, that's amazing. And so um, I think what keeps you going has always been the mission, right? And in your case, you know, you've you've accomplished all these different sort of mental and physical challenges over the years, and. And, uh, you know, one of the things I want to make sure I do before I forget, I've got it right here. This book right here, folks. In fact, you're wearing the same shirt now. Anyways, um, that was but it looks like, I know, I know, I got gotcha. you. Um, anyways, but uh, beyond average, um, I read this book. I almost didn't put it down. And it's it's not short, but it basically chronicles, for the most part, that one year that he had where he accomplished five incredible uh, feats that that I think are amazing. I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, but it's funny how you like to say that you really never set out to write a book. Instead, you were thinking, "Gee, I need a business card." Um, this is a you probably can't put too many of these in your wallet. But when I read this book, and it's it's really interesting when you read a book written by somebody you know, it's almost like Robert, you were reading it to me because I could hear your voice saying all these words. But um, let me just let me just say this yeah, real quick. Sure, sure. For those of you that, you know, you don't need to read the book. It's not a big deal. But if you're interested, if you go to my website, there's an audio book. And you don't have to read it. You can listen to it. And I did the, my own narration. And it was way more fun doing the narration on that book than write the stupid thing. Because I got to hit my leg and laugh and tell stories. And this isn't in the book, but blah, blah, blah. And so a lot of guys, you know, their pickup truck or something, they, they listen to this, the thing. Well, I um, someone asked me if I had an uh, audio version of my book. Oh, I just happen to have one here. Win again, um, and uh, you know, I said to them, "Well, I haven't gotten around to doing that yet, but I'm more than happy to call up every night and read a chapter." So, um, is that something you can offer to do, Robert? Is maybe give everyone a call here? Uh, you know, every night we'll have a different chapter. Um, sure. But for everybody uh, watching and listening. You know, some of the accomplishments. I mean, we talked about the World Marathon Challenge. We talked about Kokoro. Um, you, don't need to, you don't need to go into all that stuff. What I'm trying to get at with all these accomplishments is it puts put you in a position to be able to do this row across the Atlantic. And I think that um, what I want other people to know, though, is that as you talked about earlier, being a mindset coach, it's something that I encourage everybody to talk to you, whether it's after the fact or somewhere down the road. Uh, to talk about how to get in that mindset to be able to maybe not necessarily roll across the Atlantic, but maybe it's something as simple as being afraid to cross the street in a busy, whatever it is, intersection or something. And how can you get to the point where you can conquer your fears and conquer a lot of this stuff, right? That's that's the whole point of a lot of this is that, number one, the cause is fantastic. You know, I, I think it's amazing to not just raising money for suicide, uh, veteran suicide awareness, but raising the awareness of it. Uh, it's something that I think most Americans don't necessarily know about is, is how many people take their lives every day. And it's, it's horrible. And I think, you know, all the, the COVID shutdowns and whatnot sort of helped um, or hurt, but I mean, really increased that number. But give us a sense of, if you could, how, you know, doing all this training and doing all these things in terms of mindset, if someone is struggling with a challenge that's in front of them, whatever it is, if it's a physical one, a mental one, what are some of the things that you like to teach someone when you're doing some of the mindset coaching that helps get them past a specific challenge? We teach, we teach what are called the big four. Okay. And if you guys, you ladies, guys, if you folks are interested, you can go to sealfit, S-E-A-L, fit, F-I-T dot com. And on there, put in emotional control or mind control. And there's a ton of videos in YouTube okay. of 
our founder, Mark Devine, teaching. And we teach four basic things. And I wish somebody had taught me this before I went to special ops, because in our day, you just have to tough it out. But we now have ways we can equip people. The four things that we work on is number one, breathe, breathing. And you say, what's the deal with that? We teach deep nasal breathing. Why? Because it's unnatural. And so, A, the, the type of oxygen you get from mouth breathing compared to nose breathing is A, a different quality. B, most people are just panters like dogs, just all the their tongue out. But we have control over our breathing, and our breathing is used for emotional control and mental control, meaning that if you practice breathing this way on the freeway hold it and we teach our guys to get to six breaths a minute only six breaths a minute why because it takes mental control why because you have lung capacity like this you have lung capacity way around the back and that's why free divers go <laughs> because they're opening up that water bottle boom, 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 and they're pushing air into these cavities that you have never experienced in your life. Hmm. Meaning the guy said to me, okay, I want you to uh, breathe for, uh, or to hold your breath as long as you can. So I think one day out of the cool blue, I did 40 seconds, 45 seconds. <laughs> he said, okay, now I'm gonna teach you this. And I went, I want you to do that 50 times, 50. Ready, set, go. Thinking that you're packing the stuff in a box. Now I said, now let it out slowly, like. And I held my breath for two minutes and 20 seconds. Wow. Imagine. And no one knows that there's that kind of capacity that's never been utilized. But what happens is when you practice thinking about your breathing, what I do is when I'm not thinking right on the freeway, I'm not thinking right about some person that I don't appreciate. I have to say to myself, get hold of your brain. And so I hit my leg. And whenever I hit my leg, that means, why are you hitting your leg? That's stupid. Oh, I want to think differently. Oh, then what do you got to do? I need to begin to breathe differently. And when I do that, you cannot have a negative dialogue running through your brain at the same time as you're thinking about holding your breath. So right. all of us have a dialogue running through our head, music, history, people, thoughts, all day long running through our head that we think are our thoughts, but they're not our thoughts. They're thoughts that are from something and they're trying to plant and live in your head. Imagine this, when you're born, your brain is completely blank. Everybody listen to me. It's blank. There's nothing there. And then input begins to come into your life, right? Right, right. Like I'll stand up and hold on to the coffee table. I think if I scream, I'll get this. I think I, would, I have five kids, you know. I've did 12 years of diapers straight, nonstop. Ooh, <laughs> got me in the face, you know, and that, you know, all that stuff. So I, I've been there. And what happens is, is that we have had stuff come live in our brains that's not us but they've taken root and we act like they're it's ours but neuroplasticity is the rewiring of your mind where you can change the way you think you can change the way you eat you can change the way you do anything it's just a muscle that's been packed with stuff first grade sixth grade divorce screaming yelling anger hurt and all that stuff takes root in there and all of a sudden we got this package that we're lit, working with and it's in our brain all the time we go that's us it's not you it's the stuff that's come and planted in there since you didn't take work to make the thoughts that you want in your brain in your brain and so we say breathe and when i'm practicing that breathing like in the middle of the night when i go back, can't go back to sleep i'll just start breathing deep breaths and count to 10 15 20 which means i can't think about anything uh -huh. but what i'm trying to do and I all of a sudden find myself falling back to sleep for insomnia and stuff yeah. like that. So hmm. we teach people to stop the negative, cut it and reboot and think what you want to think. The mantra 
that you have that's positive. Let's go practice that morning, afternoon, and evening. Let's begin to think about our morning at 7 a.m. At noon, rethink again for the afternoon. In the evening, rethink again, reboot for the for the, the nighttime, and you just take control of your brain. Number two, we use positive self-talk. Okay. We begin to say the things that we need to say instead of, I'm screwed, it's no big deal. Um, I'm tired, you can do it. I'm pissed, I don't want to be pissed. I'm not going to let that get in my head and live there. I'm going to let it go. Um, I'm going to I'm going to just not think on that now. You know, and blah, blah, blah. We do, people see me talking out loud all the time. What are you talking to? I'm talking to myself. <laughs> Why? Because I need it. Why? Because I need to say the right thing. Because I'm saying something positive, I can't think the negative. I can't think positive and negative at the same time. Only one set of thoughts can be in there. Right, right. right? right. Well, thirdly, then we go into mini goals. What can okay. we do in the next five minutes? What can we do? I can't do 100 more burpees. I can do five. Can I do five more? Can I do five more? And break the elephant and eat it one bite at a time. So you're not overwhelmed with stuff. And then lastly, we do visualization. And we teach them to visualize them succeeding at what they're thinking they want to be, what they want to do, how they want to respond next time you're angry or you want to say something. So when immature people say, you made me do this. Nobody made you do anything. You chose to respond that way. No, no, you, you made me get angry. Nah, you got angry because that's how like you, you like to respond to this kind of situation. It's a choice. And we tell our young guys, no one's going to make you do anything except for what you've programmed your brain to do. If you want to quit, be a quitter. If you want to grow, well, I'm going to grow. And I'm going to find a mentor and a coach. And I'm going to change. And so those four things, we do that all day long, every day. When I get up, Why? I don't want anything in my, like, when I trained for the 777, I was tired for three years. It was five events that I did. And yeah. every morning at four o'clock in the morning when I got up to go work out, if I listened to my head, I wouldn't have got out of bed. I didn't want to get out of bed. And sometimes I'd roll my feet out and I'd say, first thing would be, oh, and I have to, don't say it, don't say it. This is a great day. It's worth it. I'm going to be epic. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do stuff that people are going to, I'm going to, I just, I just begin to talk and talk and talk to pretty soon. I got out of bed, went to the bathroom, drank my water, did my stuff, found myself on the freeway in the dark. And those feelings didn't hijack my life, didn't hijack my goals. But every day I have snakes in my head that want to say, think these thoughts. Right. Right. Why are you so hard on yourself? I'm not being hard on myself. I have potential. I can do stuff. But everyone wants to tell me how old I am or what my issues are or blah, blah, blah. And so I just, I'm not going to think those thoughts today. And you, I'll give you a thought. So this lady, I'm doing a corporate security um, consultancy. I go for two years every month to a San Jose IT place and I consult. Mm -hmm. And I say to the HR lady, you know, how many people are on drugs in here? What do you got going? And she said, well, you got these kind of people on this and this and this. I said, great, you know. Who am I speaking to? You're speaking to 150 people over here, blah. And it wasn't at all about this topic at all. But this lady in the back says, can you help me? And I go, I don't know what. She said, I have panic attacks every night. Hmm. I've had panic attacks for 15 years. Wow. And my husband really hates it because it goes off somewhere between 12 and 2 in the morning. I, go, ah! I freak. And hmm. I take pills. Take pills real quick, quick and I knock myself out. She said, can you help me? I went, I don't know, but you could try this. So I taught her how to box breathe. Box breathe is where you breathe in for five seconds and hold for five seconds. And exhale for five and hold for five. Then inhale. Hold. What's happening there? I can't think about anything in my head except for what I'm trying to do. Hmm. Which means I get to I have a I have a free moment to reboot my brain from the anger, the anxiety, the whatever. Anyway, yeah. when you have that attack, instead of taking that pill, I want you to go box breathing tonight. She goes box breathing. She comes back the next morning and she said, I go, Hey, what happened last night? She says, I didn't take the pill. So why? She goes, I don't know. I was doing my box breathing. I fell back asleep because she blocked the anxiety. Nice. By getting inside your head, going inside, getting in control, 
and pushing that stuff out. So we try to help all kinds of people with how to think better. And then it helps me because whatever I try to do, the first thought is you can't, couldn't, shouldn't. It's not wise. It's not this and that. But if I live with that, I put limiting beliefs ruling my life. And my right, goal is right. to inspire and encourage as many people possible in my life with you can do better. You can be better. You can think better. You can you can be more at peace. You can be more positive, just like I've learned how to do it. I'm not a hot guy. I'm not a big stud. I'm not some super whatever it is. I've just learned to sharpen the pencil and sharpen the pencil and think better. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, wow, you know, you're not average. I guess, I guess I'm not. Go ahead. You're, I'm sorry. You're beyond average. But one of the things that, that I, you know, when I hear about the box breathing and, and, and some of the other stuff you talked about is that I see it with athletes all the time. I see it with other people all the time where, you know, if you're, if you're an athlete and you're visualizing, you've got your eyes closed, you're thinking about making a hockey save or kicking a field goal or whatever it might be. You know, these are all things that uh, highly successful people use, athletes use, military use, and so forth. This is all, this is all great stuff. Um, but let me, let me just say this. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Point. Sure. Every pro athlete, like every quarterback in the NFL, um, Pete Sampras, uh, all the great, they have three coaches. They have a conditioning coach. They have a skills coach. You right. know, get in good shape. Then yeah. hit the tennis racket or throw mm. the ball. Then they have a mind coach. Yeah. And those three coaches travel with that quarterback every day. And they say, how are you doing? And, you know, they repeat the stuff to get the kid to, to stay in the game under pressure. But that guy is smart enough. I was watching John Gruden on ESPN as he's interviewing these different quarterbacks. And he, they all said, yeah, I, the mind coach has changed my life. Because I've learned how to grow under pressure and think differently versus the way I was wired. And um, it's just a wonderful lot to think that all of us, if we had a mind coach, you know, the physical thing is one thing. Um, the skills coach, you know, being a CEO, being an entrepreneur, that's, a, that's another thing. But someone to help you with the snakes in your head when the pressure's on. Just imagine how much healthier we could be as people. But we just think... This is the way I think, and so I'm going to think it. That's the way I've survived before, and hope it keep, continues to work for me. And it it causes problems. But you know what's incredible? It's just just the simplest tweak sometimes in the way you think and the way you train your mind to act and react can can work wonders. And that's all it takes sometimes. You know, what, what a lot of times when I'm doing my coaching, it's incredible to me to be able to speak to somebody and offer some word of whatever it might be a tip or a strategy and it's like switching the light switch on it's it's really remarkable and i think that's a lot of what you're doing is sometimes you might think gee this seems like a fairly basic thing to say or to suggest but for most of us we we've never heard it before and it's completely life-changing and i think that's that's what makes that the whole idea of being a mindset coach so important here's something that's real sad if you guys have a pencil and paper, we want to write this down. This is a leadership truth. The leadership truth is people change only when, and I'll give you three things. People change only when, number one, they hurt enough that they have to. Mm -hmm. Number two, when they learn enough that they now the light goes on, oh, I want to. Number three, when they receive enough that they're able to. So one is just, I heard enough, you know, my wife won't talk to me or my kids hate me or I'm broke and I broke again. I heard enough. Okay, I guess I'll make the change. Number two is when I learn, oh, I didn't know that. Nobody ever taught me that before. Learn enough that I want to now. Didn't know I could. Thirdly, when I receive enough coaching, mentoring, um, whatever, that I'm now able to. I can get the fish. I can fish the fish. I know how to fish. Right, right. And 95% of us learn, number one. 
95% of us only change when we hurt enough that we have to. Yeah, of course. And that's yeah. sad. Yeah. So when you're doing hiring of people in a job, ask them how they learn. Because you don't want to spend a bunch of money on an employee that only learns through pain. And they'll lie to you. They'll say, oh, you know, I, uh, I crashed that car. You know, when I got my second divorce or uh, and you keep poking around, you'll find out that the way that they've grown is by surviving these pains, which mean they're going to work for you, probably making mistakes versus being smart to say, teach me or equip me. And when we ask our young guys, you know, our interview process, how have you, how have you learned so far? Oh, you know, got my butt kicked. Or, uh, you know, I crashed my car or, you know, my girlfriend left me or I did drugs that had to stop. You know, what happened in rehab? I had enough pain that I finally came to my senses. We all learn different ways. Right. And you, you out there, we have to choose every day. I want to learn better. Let somebody else make all the mistakes and let me learn from them versus having to make all the mistakes. Exactly. Go ahead. Now, um, Matt has a good question. He was asking because, uh, you know, you're, you're 71, whether you feel it, act it, et cetera, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, he wants to know, doing this, doing the, your transatlantic journey, will it be, in your mind, sort of more challenging and difficult today than it would have been 10, 20, 30 years ago? Or not necessarily. Sure, because I didn't think real good 10, 20, 30 years ago. I didn't, you know, I, I, I made so many mistakes and have my own issues. You know, I, um, I have issues in my life that I'm working on and have been working on. I was sexually abused twice, you know, in junior high. Um, my mom almost died with lupus. I was born a disabled child and I got adopted. I had rejection issues. I had self-worth issues. Right. I had comparison issues. And all of us have issues. And there's nobody who doesn't have issues. There's nobody who's perfect. Everybody has grown up in a, in a family that's not perfect. Right. Brothers and sisters and friends. So um, the more I can grow, the better I can become as a person. And my goal in life is to be a better man. And so how can I be a better man to my next door neighbor, to you know, people I coach, to friends, to those in the hospital? How can I be a better man? And you have to figure out what your why is, and what you're doing. And most of us are survivors. You know, we just pay our bills and run ragged and raise our kids and pay our taxes and watch inflation. And we're just on that treadmill of life versus thinking, how can I be better? I went and got three mentors. You know, I, I got a mentor for making money. I got a mentor for how to raise kids. And I got a mentor for how to have a better marriage. Why? Because humility always opens the door and I, I need help. So I'll go find people who have better at everything and say, how'd you do that? And most people, they they don't have the ability to, to just say, hey, you know, blah, blah, blah. But you, someone had to say to me, you have to think better. Robert, you don't think right. Do you feel that you're in a better spot today to be able to row the Atlantic versus maybe when you were, you know, 31, 41, 51? Sure. Okay. Great. It's a mental game. Yeah. The, the Atlantic of three hours on and three hours off is a mental game. It's not anaerobic. My heart rate's not going to go up. It's monotony. It's boring. We wrote 18 strokes, 18 strokes a minute. That's 1,020 of those an hour. And in my three hour shift, I'm going to do this 3,060 times. <laughs> and I have to be in sync with all the blades. Yeah. Well, right. the blades at the same time and the boat's going to be going like this and that you can't mentally go somewhere. You have to stay focused on balancing the boat and put your oar at the same time and keeping your head in the game. And I'm better mentally than I was 20 years ago. That's, that's amazing. Uh, because, uh, you know, Max had asked if you, you take that three hour break all at the same time, but it's, it's six on six off, right? That's how you're doing it. Or is it three, 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 yeah, three. Yeah, no, there's there's six of us rowing, and six row for three hours, and then we get off, and the other six start rowing. Got and it. They row three hours, they get off, and our six get back on. Got it. Got and it. what happens is, if you know crew, university crew, the left side's called port, and yep. the right side called starboard, and so you get out there and you row an hour and a half on port, 
and you scoot uh, across and you row an hour and a half on starboard because it. it sweeps. It's not a it's not a dual yeah, right sweep like galley right. through. And so you get this side of your body, then you get this side of your body, and the challenge is stretching because you go like this off and on for twelve hours a day. There's no place to downward dog out there. <laughs> there's, there's no place to say, ah, oh, I think I'm going to stretch, you know, the boat's going like this, it's going yeah. forward and backwards, it's all core, lower back, gl uh, glutes, hamstrings, and so it's a, it's a game to, to figure out how to get stretched and to, you know, move. <laughs> it, it'd be an interesting experiment. Wow. Uh, Jason was asking, Robert, what's the best way that we can help support veterans to bring more awareness and possibly prevent suicide? So what, aside from you know, whether it's fundraising and increasing awareness from your perspective, what are some of the other things that we can do? You know, um, first of all, you could just care. You know, we all have these low, you know, I care. Well, how much do you care? You know, well, I care. Have you cut a check? Well, I don't care that much. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> yeah. um, you first got to say that's, that's an issue. And suicide in general, um, hopelessness selfishness of just saying i'm done and i'm going to make everybody miserable around me when i do this um first you got to care about that and there's so many things to care about um second of all you got to get educated a bit on what's happening and um then you can decide to what what level you want to care about which cause and there's, there's a ton of good causes you just have to say I want to know why these guys and these ladies come home and mm. kill themselves after deployments. Right. And um, down in San Diego, you know, Naval or Air Force, Lackland Air Force Base in, in, in San Antonio, I mean, there's funerals all the time. Mm. And um, I'm working with a kid here. Um, he um, he stepped on an IED, blew up both of his legs, 23 years old high school kid, went in the army, get away from home, got on deployment, had his legs blown off, had his right thumb blown off, and got blown up in the side here. So he's in a chair, and he, you know, rolls himself around, and sits himself in the front seat, and pulls his chair up, and then opens the back door, throws it over the side, gets in. He does that all day long. And, um, <laughs> He's got issues. And so I talked to him about how's your brain? You want to end it? You want to just pull a plug on yourself or you want to grow up and deal with it? It's not, you're not the first, you're not the last, and you're not the worst. Mm -hmm. So you choose the level of whatever you want to do and tell me. And then we talk. And we have to talk straight like that to all the guys and, and ladies and say, you know, what do you want to do? And we get then involved. We have a, but we have a program. And our program is, and it was doing growing really well until the pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. We have lots of folks that don't want to go to the VA. They don't like the VA. They'll trust right. the VA. Right. And so we get phone calls from the VA that say, these guys don't want to talk to us. They'll probably talk to you. And then we call them and talk to them or they call us. And we say, what's your issue? What do you hate about the VA? Blah, blah. You want to talk to one of us? And so we hire a, um, a therapist. And that therapist gets on the phone and talks to them. And then we pair their airline tickets and their hotel, and we fly them into a retreat. So we'll fly in 20, 30 guys or ladies in a retreat. We'll have therapists there and we'll break them into small groups when we begin to talk. And then we break them into boat crews. A boat crew is a small group with a leader. Mm -hmm. And we put them in weekly boat crew talking so that they can't just be silent and they can be called out by their other guys like right. why are you being so silent or why won't you talk or why don't you be real why are you such a liar and so they get called out and they're forced to make a decision to grow up and all that costs money we went through two hundred fifty thousand bucks gosh three years ago wow. so quick you know flying them in paying for their food paying for all the stuff getting the therapist get the thing going doing the follow-up pay, paying the boat crew leader that's his group of of folks and our rate, you know, we, we didn't lose hardly anybody when we had that kind of accountability, but being left on your own to have to think your thoughts for any of us, 
married, unmarried, single, you have your own thoughts and you're stuck in your own head. You don't always think right. And so that's what we have to do is get guys to open up and, and dump that stuff out. Let us work with it. And the sad part was that Mark Crampton, he watched all that. He never joined in. Maybe we cried. Maybe he didn't think it was that bad, but we're losing 18 to 20 a day. And it's just terrible um, as all suicide is. Well, look, uh, I, I truly, uh, you know, appreciate what you're doing. Uh, I think it's, it's fantastic because it's going to be, you know, that's not just important to, to again, raise funds and raise awareness and so forth, but it's, it's also, you know, something where I th- I'm hoping that people will see the lengths that you are going to, to support, you know, Mark and, and, um, unfortunately and his family that he left behind. So, you know, thanks in advance for doing this. Um, how can we, just out of curiosity, is there a way that we can track you as you're doing this? You know, if you go to my website, okay, or the other one you can go to is, it's called Rob Rose for Vets. Yeah. Yeah. Org, and that's Rob, capital R, Rose, R-O-W-S, the number four, yeah. V-E-T-S, Rob Rose for Vets.org. They're going to publish where they can, where you can come on and you can follow me the whole time. And there's a guy we're paying and he's rode the Atlantic and he now is a social media guy who helps rowers get their story out during that 40 days. So we'll be on satellite phone and video and we'll be talking to him as, and we'll be telling him what's going on the whole way across the Atlantic. So people can just on Christmas Eve, watch me eat a candy bar or a, pretzel or something, you know, and I'll say, hi guys, I'm a thousand miles out the sea. It's Merry Christmas to you. Ho, 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 you know, and you know, it'll be a fun way to follow the storms, the rolling over, the heat, um, the people not getting along. Uh, it'll be an interesting time. You can follow all that. <laughs> that. It'll be uh, the people not getting along. It's going to turn into, uh, what's that called? The, um, under the deck. Or, yeah. One of those Mediterranean. Yeah. Anyways, well, look, uh, I truly appreciate your time as always. Thanks for being here. I'm, we're going to go back to just uh, some table chatting in a, in a couple minutes. But um, thanks so much for sharing your story and your time. And uh, I'm so excited for you. I just want to make sure everybody knows that the website is RobertHamiltonOwens.com and also Rob uh, Rose for vetsorg I threw that in the, uh, in the chat there. But also... Um, you know, I encourage any of you out there that if you want to have an amazingly compelling speaker to come join, whether to speak to your company or your group or any organization you're aware of, please reach out to Robert or I'm happy to make an introduction um, to, to tee let that me do, up. Mark, let me, yeah. let me just say this. You sure. guys, if you want to ask more questions or you know somebody like this mom asked me today if I talked to her son, mm. I said, sure, just call me. My number is 949 949- Nine four nine five four two nine six zero zero nine four nine five four two nine six zero zero. And text okay. me, and I field questions and calls uh, from civilians and military and uh, people all the time. So don't worry about. I mean, I just say, hey, I'm so and so. I heard you. Can we talk? And again, yeah, if you like, I do a lot of speaking. Um, and actually, I'm funding this row by my speaking. So the fun thing is my wife says, okay, you can do stupid things, but you can't spend our money. (laughs) I mean, you know, you're a retiree, act like one. We're not unlimited resources, so you can't spend our money anymore. You spend them on too many stupid things. Like that 777 costs $40,000. And, you know, I ran a, I ran a half Ironman on Sunday, two days ago, and it cost me $3,500 with all the stuff with, everything so she says if you're going to do these stupid things you raise the money so um i speak and this rowing thing has cost me over thirty thousand dollars so far just getting to do this thing wow and so all the money on that thirty thousand came from speaking and so i go to corporations i go to schools i spoke to five thousand uh kids in uh south africa in march went to all these high schools and corporations and, and spoke and answered questions. And so 
I appreciate it. If you could help me have more speaking opportunities, it can pay for my stupid things. And uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm mailing my, my last $6,000 in tomorrow for this row. And that came from um, two speaking gigs. And so like $500 is nice and $5,000 is nice, but I get to stay in the game if I can speak and make some funds. So I'm announcing the new website, pay for Robert to do stupid things.com. <laughs> we'll be all set. My wife, said, my wife said, you can't do it. They won't give to you. They won't call you. You can't. And, I, and so she crossed her. I'm like, you're not going to do a 777. And I raised the money. <laughs> and I, in other words, I raised the money. And she just, nice. oh, no. I love it. I love it. All right. Well, listen, congrats on, on everything you've accomplished so far. Thank you for um, really being out there and being a sort of a public face of uh, something that's um, obviously something that needs to be uh, eradicated as completely if possible. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that I like to say is, you know, if, if you know any veterans, just have just have conversations, just 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 talk to them and listen to them. Um, but if I can help, if I can yeah. help any of you with anything, feel free to give me a call and, and we'll communicate. Awesome. Thanks so much for being here tonight, uh, Robert. I really appreciate your time. Best of luck in December and heading into January. I hope those 40 days and nights go back, go by like that. Uh, they may I not, they but, I hope, I would, but the, I'm sure hey, someone Mark, will. Thank you, yes, thank you so much for having me on and even yeah. caring about this topic and caring about me. Uh -huh. I appreciate it. You know, we ask our men and women in the armed forces to do so much as it is. I think the least we can do is really try to help them on the other side. So um, let's all do our best to do that. Well, thanks. Thanks again, Robert. Appreciate it. You bet. Have a great day, everybody. All right. Hope thanks. Yep. Bye. All right.